Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Robert. I, I have to say that I um, I'm so happy that we're doing this. Um, I know I've been hounding you for a while, and, um, and I, I'm, I'm thank you for doing this. And um, I've been, as you know, a, a big supporter of of what you do and why you do it, and the whole process and stuff. And I just love what you're doing. Um, I figured it would be nice to get more of an idea of who you are and and how did it come about what's a little bit of your history and and um because you know more and more and more people are getting interested in moba and then they might not know really what's what's going on and who you are so um i just wanted to start with um a bit of your history family history i know your your, your family is into i think uh mining and and farming uh if i'm correct i mean the mining has been since the 60s i think I, I just looked on Google uh, Street View, and I'm I'm really impressed. There's actual Street View around there. Um, I saw that the mine is is right next to the distillery. Um, yes. So, so uh, how did this come about? Like, what's the family history, and how did this turn into Moba Ram? Um, well, first of all, thanks for thanks for having me on here, Ivo. It's a, it's a great honor for me to. Be sitting here in the little, well, outside the tiny little town of Malalaan in South Africa, talking to people all over the world about uh, my tiny little rum brand that I've started as a hobby, and it's now reached the stage where people like Eva want to know more about it in Canada, and, and that's that's awesome. It's it's really, really gratifying, and, and thank you very much, um, uh, Eva. Yeah, my my dad um, grew up in, in a mining industry. He's grandfather was in the mining industry so, uh, and his his father in other words my great grandfather was a, was a mechanical engineer um but yeah for the last three generations we've been in mining um and my dad worked his whole life in the mining industry and and in the in the 1980s he bought three very small mining operations uh here in south africa um and and started a business called Shamat Holdings, and and he still still owns that business. I I run most of it, um, but yeah, times have gotten gradually tougher and tougher for us over the last sort of twenty years, and yeah, that's what's made me look at, at other opportunities and what else we could do. Uh, I just don't don't see a, a bright future for us in mining. Uh, I hope that changes, but but mining in South Africa is is not going through a, a good phase. Um, and yeah, that's what made me look around and, and try and find other opportunities. And we had some sugarcane growing on on ground that we owned that that uh, that wasn't ever going to be mined, but which we owned. Uh, and we farmed sugarcane on that for for about two decades, um, and we still do. Um, and that's what made me look at sugarcane because it's one of the things we have and we, we're in a, a cane growing area. Um, and yeah, I, I started looking at anything I could do as an alternative to mining or to additionally to mining. Um, and yeah, making alcohol out of sugarcane came to mind pretty quickly. Um, and I started messing around with that, but on, on a very small scale. I'm a mechanical engineer myself, so I started building little stills and contraptions that would kind of laboratory sort of scale stuff to, to mess around with making alcohol out of sugarcane. And um, for the first two or three years, I, I, I was under the impression I was making cachaca because um, all my knowledge came from the internet. I've, I don't come from a background of, 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 um, of much alcohol or spirits knowledge whatsoever. So um, I Googled and read, and as I say, the first kind of, Things I read relating to sugarcane were Brazilian cachaça related. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I assumed I was making cachaça. <laughs> and, and then a Brazilian style rum I thought I was making. Um, and uh, yeah, I toyed around with it and, and it got better and better. I mean, it was awful. The first stuff I made was really horrible. It was, it was ghastly. Uh, no one could drink it. Um, uh, but I, I kept on with it. For some reason, I kept on on, on making it and, and trying to get it better and better. And, and then I went for a holiday in Mauritius and I stayed in a, in a really nice hotel there. And I met, uh, fortunately, this guy behind the bar in the hotel was uh, very knowledgeable. His name was Guillaume Raphael. And he happened to be the whole hotel group's bar manager. Um, 
I just thought he was the barman. And I started asking him about all these rums behind the bar because I'd never seen so much rum in my life before. And and he said something to me, which I'll never forget. He said to me, where do you come from? So I said, South Africa. So he says, yeah, that's why you know nothing about rum. Um, you guys only know how to make wine and brandy. You know nothing about rum. Uh, but let me tell you, wherever there's sugar cane in the world, there is rum. And... Um, that that was that was a big moment for me when when I kind of heard that and and he, he let me taste rums from all over from the Caribbean from India from all over I mean not only rums uh, sugarcane spirits from all over the world uh, they had 120 rums in the bar uh, which for me was massive I never seen so much rum in my life before but anyway this this was by far the most knowledgeable rum guy I'd ever spoken to and he told me that wherever there's sugarcane in the world there's rum and that. That, that was uh, a big thing for me. Because, I mean, I live in a valley where we grow sugarcane, but there is no rum. So uh, I thought if it's worked everywhere else in the world, uh, why wouldn't it work here? All I've got to do is make decent rum. And, and the rest of the world has proved that, uh, that it works. Mm -hmm. If there's sugarcane, there should be rum. Uh, and that's what I've tried to do, is make, make rum where there is sugarcane. So what, what did you do? What, was it just the sugarcane was just for sugar production and nothing else? Yeah, it still is. I mean, apart from me, uh, in this area, there are other guys making rum in other areas in South Africa. Um, that they have subsequently started doing it after I did. But in my area, I'm, I'm the only one doing it. So, so all of the cane here goes to two big sugar mills, massive sugar mills. Um, even internationally, they, they're big sugar mills. Um, uh, several you know, different sugar areas work on different models where you have smaller mills having only the surrounding farms flying them. And then you have other models where you have bigger mills with much bigger areas transporting their cane further. Uh, and that's what we've got. We've, we've got two very big mills um, servicing an entire area around us, which is about 200 kilometers long and 50 kilometers wide. So it's quite a big, big cane growing area. And uh, there's only two mills in it. And, and all of the cane goes there, except, except for me. So your what is that the entire size of your entire cane field, or is that uh, owned by different people? No, no, many, many, many different people. Yeah, yeah. no, we've got a very small, small farm. Um, uh, in terms of, of of scale, yeah, we've got about a hundred hectares of cane at the moment, um, which is pretty small. I mean, they're guys with a thousand hectares, so it's ten times bigger than us. Um, there are smaller guys than us, but but we we on this on the smaller end of of, of one of, of the producers. But still, most of our cane goes to the mill for sugar, and I'm using some of it for um. Okay, and then so you were experimenting. You met that guy in the bar and figured, you know what, this could be something that I could be successful at, I guess. And uh, yeah, what what was the moment when you thought, you know what, I'm going to build my own proper stills and and uh, get this going. When I met Guillaume in that in that bar, I mean, I'd already been toying around with it. I'd been playing with the ideas prior to me going to Mauritius, but I hadn't really. I mean, I'm I'm a bit of a crazy guy. I I, I try all sorts of things. I build things and 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 try many different things. So um, so the rum I'd been I'd been toying with for some time when I went to Mauritius, and and that's what kind of sparked my interest in all these rums behind the bar, and that's what made me interrogate this guy. I think he got quite irritated with me because I kept on asking him, please, can I look at that bottle? And please, can I look at that bottle? And please, can I smell that one? And um, I, th I think I started irritating him. And that's, that's when he said to me, where do you come from? And I said, South Africa. He says, well, that's why you know nothing about rum. Um, and that's, I think that's when the penny dropped. When he said to me, um, wherever there's sugar cane, there is rum. And as I say, I'd already been toying with the idea of making what I thought was cachaça or some kind of spirit out of out of out of sugar cane. Um, but when this guy rather irritating tatedly said to me, wherever there is sugar cane, there's rum. Um, that's kind of what made me think. And I mean he's right. And then I started reading up about it and and yeah, generally the cane producing areas also produce rum all over the world. And if that recipe has worked everywhere, uh, why wouldn't it work where I am? Yeah. Yeah, and then okay, so then you th figured I'm gonna make a pot still. I mean, to me yeah. that's already like a very bizarre thought process that somebody just says, "Oh, I'm just gonna make a pot still." But for you, I guess that's normal. <laughs> yeah. Well, so how did you come I, up? How did one. you how did you design it? How did you how did that go? 
mostly the internet. And then I, I, I got onto Amazon as well and bought probably 20 or 30 books on, on distillation and fermentation and um, fairly technical stuff relating to alcohol production and, and distillation. Um, and as I said, I am a mechanical engineer by training. So I, I think that way. I like, I like building things. So ever since I was a kid, I, I used to smash my toys with a hammer and build a new toy out of the pieces of, of the toys. I didn't like the toys that were bought for me. I'd like to take three of them and make a new toy. Um, so I've always been a bit like that. I, I, I generally don't buy things. I, I make them as far as possible. Machinery wise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so was that uh, building the stills just a uh, you know, try and uh, trial and error kind of yeah, thing? Or? Yeah, yeah. As I say, my first, my first, my first year probably making rum, it was horrific stuff. I mean, nobody could drink it. I mean, some of my braver staff members on the farm and on the mine would try it, and my brother tried it a bit. And I, but I mean, it was it was pretty ghastly. But it got less and less ghastly. Um, mostly, in fact, not because the stills weren't well built, but because I, was, I wasn't operating them properly. I, I I didn't really understand how to distill um, and. And that obviously everything evolved. So my, my knowledge of, of distillation and my yeah the trial and error era taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and then I learned to make a pretty neutral. That was what I was chasing at that stage. I was like most South African people. I thought smooth, light, almost flavorless spirit was 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 good stuff. Uh, yeah. So I was chasing vodka basically. I was wanting to make a really clean, neutral, uh, polished spirit. Um, and yeah, I got there. I mean, I got, I got to make 96% ethanol, which was, um, yeah, extremely light and flavorless stuff. Um, uh, and I, I think that was a necessary step though. It's now, now that I, I can make that, I'm now broadening the cuts and, and, and being more adventurous in terms of what I, what I keep. Uh, and, and, and obviously the, the middle of the heart, which is that neutral stuff, is, is not what I want anymore. That's now kind of the, it adds to the rum, obviously it bulks the rum up, but your flavor is, is, is in other fractions of the display. Right. Um, but yeah, so I spent a long time trying to make really clean, light, um, neutral alcohol, um, because that's what I wanted to make and that's what I thought was good alcohol at that stage. Um, well, I'm glad you're and, not doing that anymore. No, no, but I mean, I think you need to learn how to do that. You can't just come out of the blocks and make long pond. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Um, my mother told me a story about, I, I remember talking to her about some of Picasso's drawings. She's an artist, and um, I didn't understand them at that stage, and I probably still don't. And I was just saying to her, they don't look that skilled to me. I mean, they don't look as if it took that much talent to draw that. And she said, well, that guy spent so many years just learning to draw a hand. And he doesn't want to, illustrating a hand realistically has become boring for him. He is so talented that drawing a hand realistically or anything realistic has become boring. And it's once you have achieved that skill to, to illustrate, it gives you the kind of authority to begin to play and start to do um, more creative, free, wild stuff. And I, I, I see a similarity with, with distillation there, that you, you need to learn how to make good, clean stuff um, before you start to make crazy stuff. You can't just start taking broad cuts and including all the tails and the heads and, and, and you don't really know what you're doing yet. Um, you need to make neutral stuff and then start broadening from there and, and deciding what's, what's interesting to add to that. Yeah. And I think it's a sort of process you've got to grow into. It's, it's not something you just learn at night. No, that makes sense. <clears throat> yeah, that makes sense. And, and so I think it's quite unique that you're distilling uh, cane juice on a pot still. Uh, why? Yeah. Is that just because of what was available or do you figure, you know, I had that's it, what I want yeah. to do? When I had it, yeah. I mean, I, I had this idea after meeting um, Guillaume in that bar in, in, in Mauritius, I, I became obsessed. As I say, that, that was really what made the penny drop for me that this is not just some stupid idea of yours. Because, I mean, I do have a lot of crazy ideas and I chased them for a while and then I realized that's ah, not going to work. But the, 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 the alcohol thing stuck around for quite a while. But as I say, when I, when I met yeah, I mean, in Mauritius, that's when I kind of realized this is really something you need to pursue and something you need to be serious about because it's worked everywhere else in the world. You have sugar cane. There's no one else doing it. This has got potential. Um, 
So, and I couldn't find any fault with it. I mean, often I have these ideas and I think about it enough. I lie in bed and I can't sleep and I think about these things. Uh, and I usually find a problem and that's not going to work because of this. And that's not going to work because of this. But with a rum, I just couldn't find any reasons for it not to work. Mm -hmm. um, and the more I learned, the more I found out, the more potential I saw in it. So uh, I got I got pretty obsessed with it once once I've been to Mauritius. I, I started reading nonstop and ordering books online and designing stills and thinking about rum-related stuff pretty much permanently. Yeah. Um, yeah, so ever since then, I've, I've been pretty much obsessed with it, to be honest. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm glad you're i don't know if your family is, is too happy with that but i i'm happy with that at least you know um so molasses was just not really an option you had the cane fields there and you could just crush it and, and get your juice and and that yeah I, I had sense. this idea that i was going to make something like a single malt whiskey but using sugar cat and i didn't know that there was such a category i mean i'd never heard of pure rum or pure single rum or, i mean i'd never heard of such a thing as i said i thought i was making cachaça in the beginning um yeah. And I Googled three up alcohol production from sugarcane, and, and that's what I came up with. And that's what I started doing. I built a pot still. Um, I mean, it's much easier to build a pot still than to build a column. Um, and on a small scale, uh, if you want to go column, you need to be pretty big to run, run a column efficiently when you're small, not really an option. Uh, you need a lot of, of, of uh, fermentation batches to keep feeding the thing the whole time. Um, obviously with discrete batch, small batch distillation, you can ferment a batch, distill it, and then everything can stand for two weeks and you do nothing. Um, uh, a column still wants to run all the time. It's continuous and it, and yeah. it should just keep running. Um, and it's not, not really suited to, to really small scale production. Um, so yeah, I built pot stills and then obviously I started finding out more and, and then eventually I got to Mauritius and met Ian Burrell and, and that's when I started to realize, wow, we're doing something really cool here because Ian loved it, invited us to London. And uh, then we went to London and everyone there loved us. And yeah, it was, ever since then, it's been this roller coaster ride of, of uh, yeah, growth and interest from people overseas and meeting yeah, people like you and Stephen James and yeah, all, all sorts of people who have really liked the room. Just one more thing about, you know, you building your stuff, because I, I found that a very interesting story. I think other, others might as well. You're a cane crusher. You, you, you told me once that you, you had bought one, but you weren't satisfied. So then you just build one yourself. Um, yes. Yeah, we had a yeah, very small scale one that um, was a roller crusher. Yeah, but that 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 just couldn't handle the throughput that we needed to do. It's sort of one of these things that they make juice from for for cocktails and for drinks and that sort of thing. It wasn't a sort of production machine. Um, so I built an upscaled roller crusher uh, and that also had its, its issues. Um, and we had uh, a lot of the juice getting sucked up by the, by the cane stick again. So as, as, your, as the cane goes through the nip point in a roller crusher, it comes through on the other side, it expands. And as the cane expands, it's very spongy stuff. Uh, so it is very much like a sponge and it, and it absorbs half the juice again as it, as it expands, it sucks up half the juice that you've just squeezed out of it. So uh, I started thinking you want prolonged pressure on it to squeeze all the juice out of the cane and give it some time for that juice to run away so that um, it can't be sucked up again. So I built a new press, which is this basically a big cylinder that you fill up with shredded cane and then you put pressure on it with a hydraulic ram and you hold that pressure there for about five minutes while all the juice runs out and drops down into a bucket and you can then pump that away and then once you release the pressure there's no juice for the for the expanding uh fiber in the cane to absorb again so uh it's again it's a very batch orientated uh you could never do this for sugar more i mean you, you, it just wouldn't work on that scale um but for a small scale operation like ours it works pretty well oh. and it's unique i've never ever seen a cane press like it so i like the fact that we're the only ones running this crazy thing um and it works really well and i think it has an impact on what our rum tastes like as well because um traditional agricoles are made with um with, with pretty much sugar making technology where they shred the cane completely so they they mash it to a fire fine fine fiber 
and they extract everything out of that sugar cane. There's, there's almost nothing left in it. And I think a lot of the grassiness in in um, in the vegetal notes in, in a lot of agricoles are because of that um, the degree to which they extract everything from the cane. Uh, I think my press leaves a lot behind. Um, but I think you, you're only getting the juice out of the cane. You're not getting any, any of the sort of um, green plant type um, components in the sheath of the cane. So I think we we do, I mean, I've never made my rum with, with, with sugar mole caliber equipment. So I don't know what effect it would have on it, but Morbid certainly has a unique flavor. Um, and it's, mm. I've, I've not come across another rum that's, that tastes exactly like like ours. It's 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 almost like somewhere between an agricole and, and a molasses rum. It's it's well, I, it's I to me, of, uh, I've always called it uh, the marriage between a beautiful Martinique lady and a nice Jamaican yeah. gentleman. Like it, it, it's just you know, and, and part of that I'm sure comes from the fermentation. I mean, how how long is your fermentation mm. typically? Uh, it's that vary. It, it depends on the on the style of rum we're trying to make. I mean, our highest is three to four weeks, um, and our uh, our traditional standard stuff is is six seven days. So, um, but by big distillery standards, that's very long. I mean, a lot of guys are running one or two day, or even hours, number of hours long fermentation. So, I mean, we yeah, a week is still pretty average for us. Um, and then, as I say, the, the high ester type stuff, we, we can go three, four times that long. Uh, it depends on, on temperature as well. Winters, we definitely run a bit longer fermentations than in summer. Um, just with the temperatures being higher and the natural yeasts, I think, are, are more uh, prolific in, in, in summer months. There's, there's a lot more natural fauna and flora around. So I'm, I'm assuming there's more yeast on the cane as well in, in, in warmer months. Um, and, and and the initial stages of our fermentations are wild because as, as we juice the cane, it's as I say, it gets pressed out by this press, it, it drops into a bucket and then pumped into a bigger container. And before we even add the, the commercial yeast, it's, it's bubbling already. It's, mm. there's, a, there's a thick foam on top of it and, and the natural yeast are already having a go when we add, add our uh, uh, um, commercial yeast. So as I say, in the summer months, we, we definitely ferment a day or two less time than, than, than in summer. What, what is the uh, climate like over there? Hot, really hot, which I, think, which I think is another fact. I mean, I think there are a number of factors our rum is unique. Um, I think we are blessed with a, a natural rum making uh, terroir or, or uh, uh, it's just a, a natural circumstance here, which really lends itself to making rum. Uh, no one's done it before, um, but I really do think we have a, a great climate for it. Uh, soils are good. Um, and yeah, the, the temperature is definitely a big thing. We, we have very hot, hot days here in summer. We can get up to 47, 48 degrees Celsius, Oof. Um, which is a lot hotter than somewhere like Barbados um, because you've got on a small island, the sea obviously moderates the temperature to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we, we've got higher temperatures in summer and we get a, a bit of fluctuation, which I think is also good for, for, for aging. Um, and just high, high temperatures, which I think increases the, the speed of the activity in the barrel is definitely higher here i think um i mean our barrel conventional barrel age stuff seems to be maturing very quickly um our sort of four-year-old stuff uh, tastes like much older rum to me um so i think yeah i think our, our aging is is accelerated here even more than traditional tropical aging mm -hmm. um uh, obviously not everywhere but i think a lot of the caribbean is probably doesn't have the extreme highs that we have Okay. temperature yeah, yeah and then it, it does it drop down a lot at night <sighs> not too much um it, it does drop off definitely and, and strangely enough the climate seems to be changing the last few years have, have, have definitely gotten a bit cooler to me i remember <clears throat> getting up to go for a run at, at about five o'clock in the morning 10 years ago when i just moved down here and it was 38 degrees at five o'clock in the morning um, so it was it was sweltering even at five o'clock in the morning. Um, 
but it's that, that yeah it's definitely dropping off more we we get do get fairly cool now we get 20 25 degrees in 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 the evenings in summer um and then as i say anything between 30 and and 50 degrees in summer that's um, extreme I mean, wow 45 degrees here is a really hot day i mean there're not many days like that anymore but um it, it can get up there i, I mean 40 40 is easily achievable okay and that's still pretty hot what's your um i i, I want to just walk away from the geeky stuff we'll come come back to it uh, because you just mentioned uk rum fest i think it was 2018 um you've mentioned before that, that that was a bit of a a changing point for you what 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 happened there that changed things for you um well first of all i met i met a guy called andy kylo here in south africa who who um who is 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 uh the, the south african rum ambassador he's, he's he's pretty knowledgeable and when i met him he was yeah by far the most knowledgeable guy i'd met in south africa um who at all on rum and uh, he was very helpful. I must admit, he liked what we were doing. And he, he took a couple of bottles of, with a, with, uh, of our rum over to Miami. He went to the Miami Rum Fest in 2016, I think it was. Um, yeah, and, and dished the stuff out and got a lot of people to try it and came back with very favorable uh, news and, and, and feedback and told us that everyone liked it. Um, and then he mentioned to me, Andy, that, that, that there was this little rum fest in Mauritius in 2017. And that Ian Burrell would be there. Um, so I said to him, well, it sounds to me like a great idea. It's not too far away. Mauritius is like a three-hour flight. Um, and it's probably a good chance to go meet Ian because he's he's going to be at the smaller rum fest. Um, but much more chance to to get to chat to him and that's yeah, get him to try the rum and interact with him at the smaller festival than, than going to London. Um, so we did that. And yeah. We, I'll, I'll never forget meeting Ian. He introduced himself to me, and I said to him, "You really don't need to tell me who you are. I know exactly who you are, um, but this is who I am." And, and here's my rum. And try it. Um, and yeah, he seemed to love it. And, and Andy came to me on the second day of this event, and he just said to me, "You know, you should be really proud." I say, "Why is that?" He says, "Ian Burrell is here. Ian Burrell could be drinking anything." And the last two days, I haven't seen him drink anything other than Malbec. So I said, well, that's actually true. I mean, he has been here a lot and he keeps pouring himself a drink. And I mean, I'm very glad. I'm flattered because here and he's drinking my rum. It's awesome. But yeah, he did. He, he drank a lot of my rum um, and spent a lot of time with us. Um, and then I had breakfast with him one day and he said to me, yeah, he really likes what I'm doing. And I must please come to London. We need to come to UK Rum Fest. Um, so yeah, after leaving Mauritius, it was a, a crazy panic to get ready and it was about two months later that we had to fly to London for 2017's round fest. And yeah, that was a game changer. Um, I met Luca there uh, while I was putting my stand up, which had pure single rum on it. Uh, he, he obviously noticed the, the, the pure single rum wording and came and stood there in his typical jeans and t-shirt and looked, watched me putting this thing up and said, no, he loves that we put this on the sign. And uh, he never tasted the rum or anything, but he was really impressed with the branding and the wording and everything. And then he tried the rum and he loved it. And, you know, I had breakfast with him the next day and he, said, he really wants to do a, a belly of bottling. Uh, there were all sorts of yeah, uh, potential things with Luca, which have now finally come off, which is great. Um, yeah, Ian, uh, Richard Seal came and tried the rum and told me it wasn't bad and gave me some some tips on, on, he asked me what my, what stills I'm running. And I told him that I'd made them and I asked what they looked like and how they worked. And, um, he gave me some, some tips there, which I immediately came back and changed my stills according to what Richard had told me. Uh, and yeah, definitely have benefited from that. Um, yeah, we, we met a lot of people there. Um, and, and everyone was complimentary and really, positive and it's yeah I, I was blown away i was uh, really really happy leaving london because the who's who of the rum world all seemed to be positive and um yeah very uh interested in what we we're doing and 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 i really i came away thinking we're doing something special and unique mm -hmm. um 
the general public, I must admit, I don't think really enjoyed the run that much. I, I wasn't, uh, I didn't get the impression that the average visitor to the to the rum fests loved our rum. Uh, it was a bit like South Africa, and that a lot of people here are not crazy about our rum. But for the people who are rum knowledgeable, uh, people, bloggers, writers, um, people who I'd seen on Instagram and Facebook and who I knew were uh, people who knew about rum, they all loved it. Um, and several people came to me and said, you guys were the star of Rum Fest 2017. You were like the cool new thing, um, which I couldn't believe. I was like shocked by that. But um, no, it was awesome. It was, it, was a, it was a game changer for me. It was like, uh, like I'd won the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> and and so now you're you're well, obviously you're you're a small company um and trying Ooh. to grow what are some of these these uh, challenges you have in exporting because i i mean i've been talking to knut quite a bit about um how he's trying to get it into the states and it was difficult and uh you know you were getting it into france and um but now you found kind of a way in doing things differently i mean first of all lucas bottle your rum which must have made you feel pretty good and now there is you, yeah. eric in the states and, <laughs> and yeah and carl in canada uh, as independent bottlers who are uh, getting your rum into these countries that you weren't able to do it in any different way is is this the way to do it or are you thinking you know what we you know in the future we would like to do it differently um yeah look as, as you said with tiny and 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 Knut, meeting knut has also been a, a a big step forward for us um he's he's a lot of what i am not he's he's a salesman he he sells stuff and he's he's got uh he's got a neck that i don't have i, I I'm, not, i'm not a salesman i i make what i make if you like it you like it if you don't like it that's fine um he he's like uh he doesn't give up he he will sell it to you <laughs> and um you need that i mean I'm, i'm not i'm not that so i mean it's it's, it's been great having him uh helping us and getting us into the european market um because he loves the rum I, he and i share a lot of the same sort of thoughts on, on what we like in terms of rum um but he's got this totally different personality as i say he, he's, he is a salesman he, he can yeah he can get out there and, and convince you that you need to try this um i, I don't convince people they don't want to try they don't want to try it that's fine um i don't i don't push anything um right. but i think you need to be a bit like that so yeah uh, dealing with Knut has, has been yeah a, a, another game changer for us in terms of getting into europe and and the states and and he uh he's wanted to take on the states i must admit i've held back a bit on the states because i i felt i don't want to overcommit uh, as you say we are tiny i i don't want europe to explode and then we've got commitments in america and and we end up not being able to supply either of them properly so I could, could have actually gotten us into the U.S. So there, there are challenges and we could have been there already. It, it, it would have been pricey. Uh, and, and I just don't feel we, we have the capacity for it yet. Um, and I'd rather focus on Europe um, where, where it's gone well so far, particularly France. They are cane juice rum drinkers. They, they identify with it a bit like South Africans drink brandy where it's part of the culture here they've drunk brandy for 300 years which gets made in our vineyards down in the Cape um, the French have been importing agricoles from the French islands for 300 years and, and it's in their culture to drink that style of rum and and our rum is just sold there in France it's just I mean we haven't had to promote it or force anyone or convince anybody it's just it's sold and it's um, it's great um, Uh, and I, I don't know yet how big Europe's going to get. I think Europe's still got a lot of potential for us. I think we could do a lot more in Europe than we already are. And I think it, it's a bit much for, for us mm -hmm. at, at the size we are to take on the States at the same time. Um, yeah, yeah. So I've, I've held Kurt back a bit there. He, he has, has actually organized us a couple of potential deals that we could have pulled the trigger on, but I have not wanted to yet. Um, So I think I think what what we've what we've done with Eric um, and what what Carl's about to do uh, is 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 great. I mean, it's an, it's as you say, independent bottler. It's it's a limited amount, um, and it's a good tester for us to see how the market responds to the rum without too much commitment from from our side. 
uh, and someone else is, is handling the bottling and the branding and the, the, the distribution and the marketing and yeah, that whole angle on it. Uh, and we're still getting um, our name on the bottle, which is, which is great. Um, and being as small, small as we are and as unknown as we are, um, having these more established brands, particularly someone like Velier, um, it's obviously very good for our name to be associated with someone like that, someone who is established and been around a long time and, and has a pedigree in rum. Um, we don't have a pedigree. We, 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 we babies. Um, we're building a pedigree, I feel, but, but we still, still very small and, and new and young. So yeah, dealing with these, new, these other guys who can handle that portion of, of, of the, getting the rum to market is, is, is a good way to, to try the U S and Canada. And uh, yeah, there are a number of guys contacting us from all over the world, Taiwan, Hong Kong, all sorts of people who want to do similar things, buy single casks and, and, and bottle themselves. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting way to, to, to get into markets. It, it has a great way, if you think about it, how you started experimenting with making rum that nobody wanted to drink because it was awful. And now you're here, people are actually coming to you and saying, you know, I want, I want to sell your rum. Um, yeah. and it makes sense to me that you're focusing on Europe. It's, it's like what you said about making rum. You got to first learn how to make that white yeah. rum and, and yeah. realize what you're doing yeah. before you can move any f- further. Um, mm. we got, uh, we got Carl here on the call too. I'd love to hear from him a little bit. Uh, so he's been, uh, starting up his own company in Canada, which is, uh, like Richard Seal says, the North Korea of rum. Um, a very, very complicated, very difficult. So he's taking a big risk and, and the, the community, rum community in Canada is very, very excited that he's doing this. Um, and the first release was Fiji. Second release is going to be mobile. So Carl, you're, you're muted, by the way. You should unmute yourself. Um, how did this come about? How did, how did you get to MOBA and, and how did this connection work? So I, I came across an article about... Uh, a MOBA, what, four or five years ago, I think it was. And then I, uh, my, I, I sent an email to, 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 to Rob, I the email or message. And I said to him, how do I get some? Because I'm, I'm Zimbabwean, we're next door, uh, we're neighbors back, back in Southern Africa. So of course I had an interest because there's not a lot of rum that comes from South Africa. So yeah, I messaged him and, he, and I said to him, can I pick some up in duty free? And he said, no, we're not there. Um, and then he said to me, but I have presence in, in, in South Africa. So at the time, my siblings were at, at university in Cape Town at the time. And he said that um, he could give some samples to, 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 my, to my siblings in Cape Town. So at that point, my, mom, my mother-in-law was coming to visit. So what happened is Rob's guy dropped off some samples with, uh, with my brother in Cape Town. And then my, my brother came went back home for Christmas and then he gave the bottles to, to my mother-in-law who then came over for Christmas and gave, <laughs> and gave them to me. So that's how we started. So I had one of Rob's earlier bottles, like earlier bottlings, uh, the glass cask and, uh, and a white, one of the, uh, I think it was a, 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 a 60% uh, white, white rum, which we liked a lot. Um, uh, I, the, the marker for me is my wife keeps reaching for a bottle. She, she's, a, she's a wine girl. So but once in a while, she will, you know, she will try what I'm drinking, and and usually, if she keeps reaching for a bottle, I know she likes. I know it's a, it's a pretty decent rum too. So, <laughs> so I had seen that's the market. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we've been talking with Rob, and then we talked about, you know, what about uh, distribution and all that stuff, and it kind of went hot and cold. And then, of course, this opportunity came up uh, at Christmas, just last Christmas, and it was too good an offer to to, to turn down because, as you as Rob said, he's a small guy, so. He's not always going to have juice. And at this point, I was kind of nervous because I'd already committed resources to the Fiji. And I was thinking, well, you know, this is really going on the line, but I, it's worth it, I think. It's worth the risk. Um, I know we're not going to die wondering whatever happens, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it will do well because um, 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 uh, Rob's a rising star in the Rumble, as, as everybody knows. And this stuff is different. It's unique. And for me personally, it's uh it's uh it's 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 good because he's he's like a, he's no he's we are kind of the same people we live in the same area oh, well we come from the same part of the world so it's a it's a little cool for us so we we hope to to kick on from the fiji which has started well so yeah we'll see what happens 
And can, can you say anything about what the uh, which one it is the the, the what, what kind of blend is it what, which well, mobile we, is it so we got uh, we got two expressions we're getting the ex bourbon cask uh similar to what uh, Lucas done in Europe and then we have the South African whiskey cask as well which is what uh, Eric is doing in the states so at least you know Canadians for for, for a change we have <laughs> options <laughs> yeah yeah I would, I would, uh, I would like some bushfire, but I, it's very left field. Uh, the bushfire, as I said to Rob before, it takes me back to my childhood because uh, my grandma, when she was still alive, uh, she lives there. They used to live the old way. They live off the land, and they, we cooked with fire back in, in the country. And when I smelt it, that's the. It took me straight back there because my grandma, the God bless her, she she always smelled the smoke because she was always cooking by the fire, so. And I smelled that rum, I was like, wow, okay. Took me back to then and everything about uh, spending time with my grandmother, that rum were back. So Rob, <laughs> I need some, some bottles, please, one day. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's pretty less field, like it's, it's pretty, but for me, it's, uh, there's some nostalgia attached to that, so yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, that was the motivation for the rum. That, that's, that's what made me make bushfire, is that we, uh, we bry all the time. I mean, while we bottling a big order or we're cleaning the stills or there's any kind of overtime involved in there, often is we always make a fire and whoever's working, at, once we finish working, we eat and have a drink and, and stuff. And, and, and it's, yeah, a fire is kind of a central thing to socializing and even even when we work here we often have a fire if we, if we work late we'll, we'll have, as i say make a fire and cook something like and as a kid growing up going on on holidays uh in game farms or I, anyway basically we used to bry and make a fire and, and i think it's a very african thing not only south africa it's a very african thing um, fire is like a, a very uh big thing in terms of, of, of families and, and friends and it's a social thing it's, it's people eat around the fire, they talk around the fire, they drink around the fire um, and they, you know, cooking on the fire is a big thing um, and often sipping on a rum while we're making the fire, that smell of the smoke And, and uh, cooking fire in, in, in particular. Um, and I, that's what I try to do. Is I, I, I took the wood we, we, we bry with most and charred it and stuck it in some white rum. And yeah, I took it to France and they loved it. They went crazy. <laughs> they, they loved it. And it, it does. It definitely has this kind of, um, it's exactly what I wanted it to do. I wanted it to, to kind of express this feeling of, of being around a fire socially. Um, and yeah, I think it, it does that to some extent. A lot of people have said what, what Carla said that they uh, either people who've been on safari on holiday in South Africa, they they say that that rum takes them back to that. They they can smell it and feel it again, which is which is awesome. That's that's what I wanted to do. We've got um, Eric K from Home Ski here as well. Eric, how did that? How did you come out about with the mobile? Was it just like I need mobile in the states? I'm tired of it not being uh, available, or what? Uh, not too far off. Well, I first was uh, lucky enough to try it from Knud in Miami. Uh, I guess that was 2020, before the world ended, um, and he had <laughs> everything, and I was blown away. Especially the bushfire, which I thought was incredible. I'd never had anything like it. Um, and then about six to eight months later, I got a call from Knud saying, hey, you know, we're thinking about giving four barrels to Luca for Europe and wondering if you maybe want four barrels for the United States. And I said, is this a trick question? <laughs> like, of course I do. Um, without hesitation. And they put together four different samples. Um, and uh, I had a couple of my, my favorite testers uh, taste them with me blind, including Meredith, who's here on the Zoom. Um, 
And all four of us really, really responded to this South African whiskey cask edition. Um, it's just incredible. Really, the bird, all of them were good. There was one that uh, I describe it as DOK on steroids. It's the esters have got to be off the charts on the uh, French oak one, Robert. I don't know. Uh, oh, you froze up on me there. Uh, but that French oak, the nose on that one was wild. Um, I loved it. I think it would scare away most people. Um, so the South African whiskey cask is... To me, it, it really gives you a great taste of what is unique and amazing about MOBA without being too overwhelming to scare off people who've never had anything like it before. Um, it was a nice balance. So the other one is going to be next? <laughs> uh, yeah, perhaps. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Can you talk a little bit about that one, Robert? On why? I mean, that's got to be a two or three week fermentation. On that. Do you know the one I'm talking about? Well, and a lot of our rums have got a two or three week fermentation. So, um, the are you talking about our French cask? Yeah, the French cask. That was is it? Yeah, was it a bamboo label bottle? Uh, no, it was just a sample. Oh, uh, okay, all right. Yeah, well, it's it's it, our French cask is 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 a, is the rum we've we've won the most um, acclaimed for and the most awards for and. Um, <laughs> All of the rum fundies around the world, the guys who, who really know their stuff, have, have all responded best to the French cask. It's, it's, it's as I say, had the best uh, reviews, particularly from people who, who know their stuff. Um, it's it's, a, it's a, a blend of distillate. So it's, it's not all the same rum, but it's, it's uh, generally predominantly a first distillation rum that's, that's about a two-week fermentation. Um, and then it's got a little bit of double distillates in there as well. So I, a bit like Richard Thiel blends pot and column. Mm -hmm. uh, I took that from him and, and I, I blend double distillates or single distillates. So we, um, we put about two thirds to three quarters of, of uh, single distillate into the cost behind us. In fact, what's behind me right now are those French costs. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they X um, South African red wine costs that we refurbish. So we, we, we get the barrels in from, from the Cape and they very good quality French oak, uh, uh, um, 220 liter uh, a wine, wine cost. And mm -hmm. we open them up and we grind the inside of the barrel out. So we take about six millimeters of material off the inside of the wine barrel. And then we reassemble the barrel except for one of the heads. And then we rechar the barrel. And then, uh, yeah, seal it up and then put 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 out, put that rum in. As I say, two two thirds to three quarters of, of single distillates, about two to three week fermentation, and then a little bit of extremities from double distillates. I I, I think the heavier cut from from our double distillates, stuff near the heads and the stuff near the tails, just boosts the the flavor intensity, um, and yeah, it gives a bit more weight to the rum. It's um, awesome. <laughs> so that, that's the French cask. And then, then it's yeah, two or three years old, probably what, what you tasted. Uh, that's round about where the stuff is. There was a little bit of four-year-old. Luca has bought that. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's going to be the second Velia release, which is coming out soon. Imminently, apparently. That's awesome. But there's more. More coming. <laughs> So when, when are you, um, are, are you already bottled and ready to go, Eric? Bottled and ready to go. Uh, it is literally on a truck heading to our warehouses right now. Nice. We're shipping it out to Florida, California, and New York warehouses next week. And we should hopefully be in stores the week after. It's wow. incredible. And Meredith it's has so tried. <laughs> I actually was able to taste blind head to head the uh, Holmes Key and the Habitation Valier Mahoba. And that was interesting, for sure. I'm not going to spoil it for anyone because I'm sure everyone here is eventually going to try them head to head. But it was very exciting. Well, we can guess, Meredith. We can guess. <laughs> Meredith, did you do the daiquiri test with them too? What's that? Did you do the daiquiri test with them too? Not yet, no, because we. Um, I'm still waiting for the Mahoba to show up, the Holmes Key in store. 
okay. but ab absolutely it's going immediately into a daiquiri. Sounds good. So Robert, what what uh, how does that feel that that you know you've got your rum, you know, obviously in Europe already, but now under the Valier brand, uh Bira with Carl and um Holmes Key. How, how does that feel? Awesome. I mean, I was about to say now, just Eric saying that the, the, the rum is, is all over or being distributed all over the state or not all over, but I mean, into several states in the US. Um, it's, it's almost surreal. It doesn't really, uh, as I say, all of that rum comes from where I'm sitting right now in my tiny little distillery. And it's now yo, in the US of A. I can't believe it. I mean, I, I've always had this sort of fascination with America. Um, I've never been there. I've my run's beaten me to the US. Um, uh, never ever traveled there, but I, yeah, I think a lot of, about me is American. I'm quite extreme. Like bigger is better. I want to do everything bigger, better, taller, stronger. Uh, yeah, over the top is is uh, my my brother is much more European, and he's always tried to uh, educate me and told me, Rob, less is more. His his father was French, and he's, you need to stop being so over the top and stop trying to put too much on the label. You need to just simplify. Less is more, but I'm, I'm not less is more. More is more for me, um, which I think is quite an American kind of uh, attitude to things. So as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad my rum is in. I can't wait to drink some of my rum in America. <laughs> <laughs> so what, um, can, can you give us some sort of hints on new stuff that's come going to come out? New releases? Anything? Um, yeah, well, look, we're experimenting all the time. I mean, there's, there's, as I say, I think we we still, when I say we, mostly me, but yeah, we as, as a rum producer are, we're still babies. We still have a lot to learn and a lot to try. And I mean, there's so many variations and permutations and yeah, just different uh, experimentations of dunder and, and, and distillates and dunder and fermentations. Uh, and, and various combinations of the two of those. Uh, on distillation, there's still a lot of stuff to try. Fermentation is a lot of stuff to try. And then cask maturation, there's, oh, I mean, I've got guys offering me barrels now from all over the place. Uh, they're all horribly expensive, but they sound wonderful. I mean, there's just so many different things to try. Um, but I think the, the local theme I want to pursue a bit more. Uh, we are world famous any producers, uh, South Africa is. Um, we've won the majority of the last 20 years uh, IWSC Brandy um, Award. So we've won many of the last 20 years best brandy producer in the world. Um, pot still brandy, that is. Um, and we've got a truckload of barrels coming up now from the Cape with South African brandy barrels. So that's my next uh, my next French cask is going to be South African brandy barrels. Um, it'll be similar distillates to what we're putting into to, to the red wine casks, but they will now be ex SA brandy casks. Um, we've got two or three aging already. Uh, and yeah, they're still very young, six months or so old now. Um, but they are looking very, very promising. I must admit, it's, it's uh, the fruitiness from the brandy uh, is, is combining really well with the rum. I, I think it's our rum has a, has a natural sweetness to it, which I think is combining very well with that the, 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 the fruity brandy aspect from the cask. Um, so that's that's a, a new thing we're trying is is, is brandy cask maturation. Um, and then, yeah, we, we, I want to stick to this French cask. It works really well. It's, it's, it's great. Um, I think refilling these casks is also going to be uh, something special. I think the, the first fills that, that, that everyone knows, so the French cask you've tasted, has all been first full uh, of these barrels. But uh, all of our, our oldest ones at the bottom row there are, have all been refilled now. So they've all been uh, dumped and sold. And uh, they've now been refilled. And I think the second fill on those cars could even be better than the, than the first fill. They will need to go longer, though. Um, I don't think we're going to get results in, in two or three years as we were getting on the first fill. You're probably looking at double that. I don't know, five, six years is what I'm guessing. Um, you're going to need more time. The cars have obviously been washed out to some extent. So there's going to be less tannin and less aggressive stuff in the wood. 
but uh, I think it'll make a, a more balanced, nicer rum with more time. Um, so the second fill on these wine casks, I think, is going to be very, very interesting. Uh, brandy casks to be introducing. Uh, we're also doing a lot more bourbon cask stuff now as well, um, which we've done some some of now already. We, we've only done about 25 barrels that we've sold already. Um, but we've got a whole lot more uh, in stock. Uh, Ex-Woodford Reserve casks. Uh, we've got some Buffalo Trace casks on this, on their way. Um, yeah, uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of stuff coming up, um, and, and a lot of it's got to do with aging. I must admit, I, I don't think I'm finished playing with fermentation and distillation by any means. I mean, there's still a lot for me to learn there. Um, but maturation is now um, something I'm very interested in. I was initially very anti cost maturation because I had bad experiences with, with wine barrels right in the beginning, and I wasted a lot of rum doing that, and that's what put me onto stave aging. Um, and I think we'll keep doing that as well because uh, some people love that. They they love the oaky, smoky uh, aspects of those rums. Um, but yeah, the, the cast maturation to me is, is very exciting. There's, there's so much to try and do there. And, and um, barrels fascinate me now, I must admit. They, they really are amazing things. It's almost like they, they're living beings. They, uh, they all have their own personalities and some of them leak and some of them don't. And but I mean, the, the different flavors and tastes that you get out of them are incredible. Um, you can put exactly the same distillates in two different barrels and the different results you get is incredible. How many barrels do you have in your warehouse? <laughs> I mean, I'm embarrassed to say I don't even know. But <laughs> about, about 150 now that are full. So, and I've got several that are not full that, I've, that I try. I often do that if I get a, a weird barrel, like my first brandy barrels that I got hold of, they were in terrible condition and I had to do a lot of work on them to try and seal them again. Um, and I didn't want to risk putting 300 liters of rum in there. So I put like 50 liters of rum in there and let it roll around a bit and give it a chance to, to just sit in there for a while and see what see, see if the barrel doesn't leak, first of all, and, and second of all, what, what sort of flavor you get out of it. Um, which is hard to tell after such a short time. But I've got several of these experimental barrels that are rolling around without names on, and I, only I know what they are and what's in there, and they're not full. They, they're usually quarter full, and I, yeah, I'm just toying with them to see what's going on. So excluding those weird experiments, I've got about 150 full, full casks. But we've got um, 140 300 litre brandy uh, hogsheads now on their way up from the Cape. As I say, they were loaded today, in fact. So we need to fill those as soon as possible. So that's that's going to be a lot more rum. What do you see as, as the future of MOBA? Uh, you mentioned once to me, oh, maybe another distillery. I mean, sounds a little bit. Uh... Too much to take home right now, but uh, what, what are you thinking? Yeah, right now it is for sure. But uh, as I say, I, uh, the other parts of South Africa also can grow in areas that I think have got huge potential to to make make great rum. And I'd also I'd love to be next to the beach somewhere. I've also got this kind of dream of one day making rum next to the beach and uh, retiring doing that. So not even retiring, just ending up doing that. Um, I'll be your assistant if you do that. <laughs> cool. I, I, I look forward to it. Um, um, yeah, who knows? I don't know. South Africa is quite, a, quite an unstable place at the moment. There's a lot of, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, of, of difficulty here and a lot of political, as I say, turmoil. Um, who knows what will happen here? Yeah, it's, it's a crazy place. It's a crazy place. You go from, uh, from spending money and investing in stuff to getting ready to run away and hide. Uh, within two weeks, you've got, you've got to deal with all these, um, yeah, different things that happen. So who knows what will happen? But yeah, I want Morbid to get bigger and and to grow and to. Uh, somebody asked me how big would you like to get, and I, I always want to taste all my rum. I mean, I, I I taste all my rums. I wouldn't want to get to the point where I'm not capable of tasting everything. I wouldn't want it to be that big that you have to start dishing out responsibilities. To the extent that you don't even really know what, what your rum tastes like anymore. Um, yeah, so, uh, it's hard to say. I, I, obviously, it needs to get considerably bigger than it is now. 
at the moment it does not make money. It's um, it's just not not viable at the scale. Um, uh, your staff and your overheads and everything just cost too much for for this yeah small amount of rum to carry. Um, yeah. So we need to get substantially bigger. Um, we're building. Uh, a new distillery, which is also something pretty exciting for us. It's about 20 times the size of our existing wow. setup. So at the moment, we run two 500-liter uh, stripping stills, which then um, supply rum for, for for barrels or to be put into this the, the, the second still, the spirit still to do second distillates. Um, so we're running two 500s and a, and a 350 liter spirit still. Uh, the new setup will be 10 2,000 liter pots and one 2,000 liter spirit still. So a lot bigger, but um, we, we are building everything. The building itself, the stills, everything is built by us. And I say not, not by contractors, but by people I employ and by myself. So there's... It's very hands-on and it's going to take time. So it's probably going to take two or three years before those, those stills are all running. But that's the idea is to, within the next two or three years, be making 20 times as much rum and, yeah, start warehousing a lot of casks. Well, by our standard, a lot of casks. Um, internationally, it would still be tiny. But, uh, yeah, I need yeah. to get a lot bigger so that, as I say, it could become, get to the scale of it being viable. Financially, is that going to be in the same location where you are now? Yes. Okay. Yes. And, yeah. and so, the, the, how many people do you have working for you now at the distillery? About thirty. It, it, it changes a bit. If we're planting fields, it's quite labor intensive. So we we get sort of casual staff in that'll come in and, and, and help. So if you're planting, as I say, replanting a cane field, you 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 rip the field, so you, you get all the old old cane rootstocks out, and then you 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 use a plow behind the tractor to to pull lines in the field, and then you you cut the cane sticks into sort of short sort of forearm length pieces, and you lay them in the in this furrow, and then you cover them up. So it's quite, as I say, uh, labor intensive that the tractor pulls the line and then you actually by hand go and pack all the cane in there and then cover it up um, with soil. Um, so as I say, when we're planting, um, we, we get more people in, probably 20 or 30 temporary guys to come and help. Uh, but that's not permanent. That, that comes and goes. But yeah, generally about 30 people, uh, most of which are on the farm side. Um, the actual rum making is is quite quite small. Uh, we've got three guys tending the still, so the stills run twenty four hours a day. So we've got three eight hour shifts of, of guys watching the stills, um, and they have to also uh, keep the fire going that that that, um, that heats the stills. So there's a fire that that heats up oil, and then the oil heats the stills up. So um, yeah, there are three guys there, and then one one on on leave. So there's four guys, three of which are always on duty and one's on leave. So there's four guys looking after the stills and then um, on, on labeling and packaging and boxing and stuff, we've got two permanent ladies um, who are always here. Um, and then as I said, we get a big order in, we again get, get people in to come and help us for a short period. Um, to finish the order in time or to, to get done what needs to be done. Yeah. So yeah, we've got about about 30 people, about 20, 22 of which are on the farm. Uh, and the balance are are you know doing uh, rum making and packaging and labeling and bottling and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, but it does fluctuate according to what's happening. If we if we're planting or Makes blocking sense. a big order. Yeah. yeah. Richard um, raised his hand. From New Zealand, all the way from New Zealand. Yeah, hey everybody. Trust everyone's well. What are we? It's just gone 10 past six in the morning, so it was well worth getting up for, Robert. <laughs> Thank you. A um, couple, couple of quick ones. Just when you were talking about the cane before, um, did I hear correct? Did you say 150 acres or hectares? Uh, no, we've got about 100 hectares. Hectares, yeah, that's what I was thought. Um, in terms yeah. of your hearts, season how long does that run for well well for the sugar mill 
which is what everyone here, our whole cane growing community here is, is all orientated around supplying the sugar mill. Um, I'm the only crazy guy growing cane for any other reason. Everyone else sends their, their cane to the mill and they have a shutdown annually, which varies a bit depending on how much maintenance they need to do, but it's sort of usually a month, six weeks, sometimes even, even eight weeks. Um, and it's usually over December. So they'll, they'll sort of stop taking mill. Uh, mill I came to the mill mid-November and, and, and start up again sort of mid-January. Um, so it's usually the sort of two months over Christmas, everyone stops um, harvesting cane. Um, but apart from that, they harvest right around. Uh, and I, I don't stop. Because I'm doing mine for rum, I... Yeah, I'm not limited by the by the mills uh, operating period. So I, I I harvest for myself. So we can harvest right through the year. Got yeah. And have you been playing much around with different crane, cane varietals? Uh, not, not much. No, we've got we've got two varietals now, both um, or, or uh, varieties. I think is the correct term. Yes, um, we you know, we've got two growing two different varieties at the moment, both. Um, South African developed is that there's a, uh, a pretty advanced South African cane growing research institute um, called called that SASRI South African Sugar Cane Research Institute, and they develop these specific uh, varieties for different areas in South Africa. So we've got three different cane growing areas, and there are different varieties that we actually developed for each area. So. Um, yeah, I've only got two varieties growing at the moment, and there there is there's probably about ten or fifteen others that I could uh, I could try, uh, but I haven't gotten there yet. So that, that's another another bunch I haven't looked at yet, and and there is a lot more experimenting to be done there with different varieties. Thanks, Robert. Pleasure. We're talking about geek stuff anyway. What what's the uh, ABV you um, distill up to? Well, if as I say, I mean, we, initially I uh, my stills were slightly different prior talking prior to talking to Richard Seal in 2017, um, and he told me your stills are, are working too well, um, which I I now understand what he what he meant then. In that it was, yeah, it was, it was making too too high an ABV. It was taking too many congeners out of the rum. I mean, there were there was too little too little flavor left in the spirit. Um, and at that stage, we could go up to about ninety six um, uh, ABV, but that would take two or three distillations. Um, and running my stills, stills can be adjusted. You 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 can by adjusting how fast you take the rum off the still. You actually um, change how the still operates internally slightly, and you can get a higher ABV rum by taking off rum very slowly. You get more reflux, and more reflux will give you uh, a pure distillate. Um, so it depends how you run the still, Eva, and what you want to do. But I, I could I can make anything between sixty percent and ninety six percent. But what do you? What is typical for um, you know uh, your, your French cast you rum? Want, what you wanting to do with it exactly? Yeah, if you wanting to make the South African market wants very light, um, low flavor sort of rum, and and then you you can run this. You can make a very high ABV rum that's what they want. But yeah, French cast you want flavor, you want intensity there. Um, so there, there you're probably going into the cask, and I don't dilute it. I'm, I'm putting the rum in without any water into the barrels now. And we're coming out as you want it to be, mid sixties, uh, perhaps seventy. Um, hmm. So that's that's around about where, where we're coming off. Uh, again, another important thing with with my method of rum making is that I split all my batches into small fractions. I don't collect all my distillate in one container. The distillate comes and goes into these glass bottles, twenty-five liter glass bottles, and they they keep changing the bottles. So each batch has about Eight bottles that, that contain all the distillate. So um, I then play with all those fractions. I don't just mix them all together automatically. Um, I, I taste each fraction and decide what I want from from which fraction. 
uh, what proportion of each fraction I want. But if, you, if you mix them all together, you will change the cost type stuff here, yeah, about 65 on average. Okay. Oh, are you still there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, you look you look frozen. Yeah, you, you you're 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 somewhat frozen as well on that side, but we we can still hear you, so it's fine. Um, I I have one one more thing I wanted to ask you at the beginning, but I forgot, so I'll ask you now. They just get an idea of what your working life looks like. Like, what is a typical day in the life of Robert? <laughs> Doing, doing more crazy. stuff. <laughs> it's all over the place. I mean, I, the mind still has to run. As I say, Morva is is starting to, to to sell and grow and, and and starting to look really promising, but it is still uh, in its infancy and it still needs support and and help. And and the mining business that we run still has to run. Um, I was yeah today. I spent the whole day trying to fix. A, a drill rig that drills holes in the ground for for blasting so that we can actually excavate the mine. So I've been cutting uh, big steel plates and drilling and you know, trying to fix this drill rig to get it going. And then you know, tomorrow the rum hat will be back on and I'll be back to rum. But but even within the rum, um, yeah, it's crazy. We do we do we label we print. We make our own cardboard boxes. We, uh, yeah, we engrave all the lids for the bottles. So there, yeah, there are a lot of moving parts. And uh, some days, it's, I mean, I designed the labels as well myself. Uh, I make 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 these t-shirts. I don't make them. I brand the t-shirts myself. Um, so Eva, it's all over the place. Eh? Some days I'm designing labels. Some days I'm. Uh, checking what's going on with the stills. And a lot of days I'm just tasting rum and deciding what distillation is going to what, which barrels and which fractions of what must go where. And um, that, that's the thing I, I have a very, I, there's a lot of personal involvement with the rum making where I actually taste, I taste a whole bunch of rum and, I, and it's all split into these little fractions and I got to, I categorize them. I put them in areas according to uh, what I taste. When I taste them, I decide this would be good for that. And then I, when I taste another bottle that's similar, I put them in, 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 in different areas in the room. And then I decide those are going to go into those barrels. And that's going to go over there. And that's going to make strands. And that's going to make uh, French cast. And this will be good for white rum. And um, and I say that that's where I, I don't want more of it to get to the point where I can't do that anymore. I, I want to still be I want to have that personal involvement in the rum making where I decide this is good for that. Um, uh, and it's, it's not, it's not like I, yeah, it's, it's very much involved every day with, 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 with rum um, and the tasting of it. It doesn't necessarily take the whole day, but there's, there's a, a portion of the day is definitely tasting rum and deciding where, where that must go. Um, so yeah, the, 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 yeah. My my typical day. I was thinking today. Today I did almost nothing to do with rum. It was all. I was up to my elbows in grease and oil and yeah, steel filings and yeah. But that's that's not a typical day. But they do happen. Uh, and sometimes with, with the rum, we also having built the stills and the oil heater and the cane press. The days where you got to fix stuff. Stuff breaks. You got to fix it. Um, that's that's the big commitment is once you start building your own kit, mm. you can't find someone to come and fix it because they don't know how to fix it. <laughs> you built it, you fix it. So it's kind of a lifelong commitment. Once you've decided to to build your own kit, uh, there's no maintenance guy. Yeah. You are the maintenance guy. <laughs> yeah. So so that that makes makes it all over the place. Some days you're the maintenance guy and some days you can taste rum and some days you make labels and yeah. Do you ever have I'd, a day I'd off? I'd like to keep it. Sorry? Do you ever have a day off? If I have a day off? Um, yeah, no, I do. I do. My, my lovely little wife is a, a strong willed little person and she forces me to spend time with them. Um, Good. Shame they, they they really do need to force me though. She needs to put her foot down. Um, but yeah, I do. I do take time off. I definitely. But I'm I'm usually always 
scheming about rum things in the background. So even if I'm not physically mm. here, um, I'm thinking about it and dreaming stuff up. Um, as I told you, when we were down in Natal on holiday, um, when I was away from the distillery, all I could think about there was starting a new distillery. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm not good at switching off. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and that makes your rum better too, for sure. It's dedication, right? Well, yeah. Look, I, I think it's, sometimes I think you, you, I do need to start delegating more and deciding that we're not going to build this let's buy it and get a guy who can maintain it because mm -hmm. then you can spend more time on, on the run. Um, the problem is I, 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 I like building stuff that makes rum as much as I like making rum almost. It's, um, that's the thing I like that. I like that. It's very satisfying for me to, to build a new still and to start it up and to taste the rum that comes off that still and for it to be good is, it's hugely satisfying for me. That is an awesome feeling because you, it can't be more yours. You you grew the cane. You built the still. You told them how to run it. You told everyone what to do. And 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 when the results are good, that's awesome. Well, I mean, but then the next phase in your own progress is is delegating, right? Because you can't do it all by yourself if you want to grow as much no, as you want to grow. I'm not good at that. I'm not a manager. And uh, I'm not a communicator either. I'm terrible at communicating. I, when, when I get stuck into doing something, I go off the radar for like two weeks and don't talk to anybody. Um, yeah, which, which yeah, it's, it's, it, it is. It could be a very limiting thing in terms of how big you can get because you need to at some stage uh, delegate and mm -hmm. get people in to help you. Um, oh. I just find it often takes longer to train the guy or teach somebody to help you than to just, do it yourself um but yeah there gets a point where you just physically cannot do that anymore no i think once you get past that training part you just hire a manager and you train him and then, and then that's when it starts getting easier for you right because you know, there's only one robber right yeah unless you find yeah. a way to clone yourself which I, I wouldn't put it beside you to be able to do that <laughs> No, 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 I'm not, I'm not. Yeah, no, I don't think we'll be doing that. <laughs> well, I've I, damaged the original doing that. <laughs> I'm out of questions. So, uh, is, is there anybody else on the Zoom here who has any questions for Robert? Please. I, I was quite intrigued, Robert. You were talking before um, about the South Africa scene, you know, and, you know, obviously we know it's, you know, the, the, the cognac side and so forth. But how is that changing much in the rum world, you know, in the South African rum scene? What are you seeing there? Anything moving along there? Yeah, yeah, they definitely. Um, I mean, I've, I've been making rum in almost 10 years now, um, not commercially. I only got my license to commercially produce rum um, in, in 2015. But um, I was I was making rum and toying around with it for a few years prior to that. But certainly in in the sort of ten years that I've been thinking about and making rum, uh, yeah, there's probably I guess twenty new little rum series that have popped up in South Africa. Um, nearly all of them are molasses based and and very small scale, so they they kind of garage type setups where, where they they buy in molasses and um, do largely what I was doing right in the beginning, which was sort of hobby scale stuff. Um, but then they take it a step further and they, and they get a license to, to sell it and, and, and start producing. Um, but a grower produces from, from cane to, to, to bottle like we're doing. Um, there are only two that I know of, of in, in South Africa, ourselves and, and Topanga down in Tel. Um, but there certainly are a bunch of new guys popping up in the last probably last year or two, particularly um, of, of molasses-based uh, producers. So there, yeah, there definitely seems to be growth in in the sort of craft rum distillation space in South Africa. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
there's been a, a huge gin craze here and I don't know how many there are. There, there are numerous small-scale gin producers here. Um, yeah, every suburb's got one. And rum seems to be kind of the next one coming in terms of that. Um, a lot of flavoured, spiced, uh, infused sort of uh, uh, homemade rums, yeah. It's a, it's a fascinating situation where you can appreciate, say, Scotland or UK or even New Zealand, where you're not a sugar cane growing country. You can understand yeah. it's a very small or very new type thing. And we're seeing that, obviously. Um, but where, you know, sugar cane's been grown in South Africa for a long time, I assume. It has, it has indeed, yeah. particularly in Natal. Um, and, and I didn't know this, but, but uh, at, at a certain stage, the British Navy were sourcing a significant portion, I think 5% of the, of the blend was coming from, from Natal, from, from rum produced um, in Natal. Um, they were blending it obviously with Caribbean rum and, and yeah. Uh, so that the actual British Navy blend had at one stage five uh, percent, I think it was, of, of, of Natal produced rum, and that's yeah, that goes back quite a long way. Our uh, uh, Natal rum production predates rum where I am. I mean, uh, sugarcane where I am, um, by quite a long time. I, I don't know the exact dates, but but they were definitely growing cane and producing rum in Natal long before there was sugarcane where where I live. Um, so yeah, there has been has been sugarcane and there has been rum production in South Africa. I think it was I think it was all molasses based, uh, as far as I know. I, I've I've actually tried to look into it and and find out some some of the history, but people here don't seem to be very good at at, at keeping archives and history. And I mean, I've I've found the companies that have taken over what used to own those distilleries, and no one seems to know much. Um, all the history and the info seems to have disappeared. That's quite sad. How is it? Um, are you are you selling more local in South Africa or international? No, no, we sell almost nothing locally. Um, well, I say nothing. We we probably sell locally. We sell between between a hundred and a thousand bottles a month. Um, a really good month, we might sell a thousand bottles locally. Um, so no, we're selling more overseas, um, a, a lot more overseas. Um, this year in particular, obviously with our, our, our orders that have gone to, to Vellier and then Holmes Key and, and, and to, to, to Carl, um, that's up the volume quite a bit or the leachage quite a bit. And then our, our orders for LMDW are also sizable. I mean, we generally sell container loads, uh, full to 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 LMW in, in Europe. Um, so now we're definitely producing a lot more for for export than than local consumption. We're not a big rum drinking country, unfortunately. Um, not a lot of rum appreciation here. Um, and the guys that do drink rum are yeah they they, they want McDonald's rum. <laughs> they want uh, Captain Morgan Flavored spice, sugar stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, mass produced. Um, they're not ready for you. Yeah, they're not particularly trust about how it's made and what it's made with. And yeah, you know, it's right. Yeah, unfortunate. Guys who who do care about what they drink here generally drink single malt. Um, but there is a, a growing interest. I must admit, I've recently been been contacted by a, a local guy who's been bringing in. Very nice whiskeys from Le Maison Whiskey. Uh, and he's also started buying from, from Vellier. Um, and he's bringing in some really nice rums. And in fact, this is one of the, one of the bottles right here is, the, is the, one of the uh, Endemic Birds series from Hamden. Um, one of them was brought entirely to South Africa. This guy bought the whole, the whole calf came to, to South Africa, which is very impressive. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very glad he's doing this. He's he's doing some really cutting cutting edge high end rum stuff here in South Africa, and he's he's about to take a barrel from us. He's doing a, a, 
uh, custom bottling with us, um, which is very exciting. And I'm, I'm glad he's making inroads into the sort of fine rum sector in South Africa. And I hope it grows. Uh, I, I really do. do. Um, and I'm, I'm glad we, we're dealing with it. Um, but that's something very new. Um, there's there's no, certainly no established uh, market here for, for high-end rum. Mm. I mean, you only recently could you get uh, some Mount Gay, um, uh, which, which is great rum, but, but it was very few places that, that, uh, that stopped it. Um, and then there was a little bit, of, a little bit of Appleton that you could get hold of, um, and I think is now again available in the market. And and now there's Hamden, so that's that's great. Um, and and as I say, I hope this this new new interest in in fine rum or high end rum persists and grows. Yeah. Um, but certainly up until recently, there's been. Little to no interest in 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 rum here, okay. or rum other than Bacardi's, Captain Morgan's, right? Big brain mass produced stuff. Yeah, Carl, you're muted. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so Rob, are you are you doing anything to 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 help with changing the perception of rum? Like uh, from what I see. All you got to do is get people together and and say what you're saying right now, and that that that, that should help in piquing the interest. I know you got to go away from the rum and coke thing; it's big down there. <laughs> it's like a bit like yeah. and coke and stuff, but yeah, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just yeah, I just feel that you just got to you know get people together for a class and say what you're saying. Yeah, cool. Well, look, I, I I did initially. With my rum making, I, 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 I wanted to make Morba for the local market. And that's why I called it Morba because um, all my guys who work with me and people you see in town and uh, I heard the word Morba where I live probably like 20 times a day. Um, so when I had to think, what am I going to call my rum that I'm making out of sugarcane? Uh, I said, well, I hear Morba, Morba, Morba all the time. I, I'm going to call it Morba. Um, and that's why I actually wanted to sell it to the local market. And, and, and we tried hard for about two years. I spent a lot of money going to events um, and trying to sell rum. And, and it did. It picked up a bit. Um, but we were spending so much money on it. I just couldn't, I couldn't sustain it anymore. Um, and just as that was sort of coming to an end, luckily we met Knut, well, Knut found us and Knut, uh, went to LMDW and they got they tried our stuff and they loved it and then they started taking it to France. So um, luckily now we have this kind of uh, growing interest overseas and then now uh, you guys are taking our own to Canada and, and, and Eric's got us in the states and Belius bottles some stuff in Italy and it's and there's some guys in 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 uh, Taiwan buy stuff from us and and Hong Kong sounds like this some picture as well. Um, so the, yeah, there's, there's, there's this growing uh, overseas interest, which I think will help locally. Um, people here are very brand conscious. Um, obviously, not everyone, but the masses, your average Joe here wants to drink a brand. He doesn't drink a product. He drinks a brand. Um, and if we can become a brand, if, we, if guys can see a drinking more in Paris, then, then they'll want to try it. But when they hear it's local and it's made in Malalan, they're like, oh yeah, this guy, this stuff must be judged. If it's made in Malalan, you probably go blind if you drink this stuff. So yeah, they 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 immediately hate it because uh, it's local and it's small. And so I'm hoping that once we can kind of grow overseas and get a name for ourselves overseas, that that will in turn help locally. Um, I mean, we've got they're locally that we've been trying to get into for like. I don't know, five, six years, and they just refuse to stock our stuff. We give them samples. They make all their cocktails with Bacardi. They will. They refuse to try our rum. They just don't want to know. Um, as I say, there's this brand consciousness here, which is difficult. Um, and I'm also not a salesman. I'm, I have to admit, I was, I was just saying this earlier, that I like to make rum. Selling rum is not, is not my strong point. I, I'm not good at convincing people. If they don't want to drink it, <laughs> they don't want to drink it, it's fine. Um, I need I need another guy to do that. Um, I need someone, yeah, a, a strong marketing guy, which which we haven't 
It's also it's a tough it's a tough crowd this time. Most of it we've tried several people sitting in the room here, and it's just it's been it's been uphill. Um, yeah, we're not giving up, and luckily we've got got this sort of export uh, market will keep us going, and we can live on that, and hopefully build a name on that, and and I hope that will also encourage people to try our stuff when they when they see it's drunk overseas. Um, as I say, this this guy locally that I've met, um, who's bringing in all this nice stuff from from Europe. Um, he's also doing a cask with us here, all for local sale. Um, and, and I hope, I hope it's going to work. He's, he's much better at selling than I am. And, and I hope, hopefully he can pitch it in the right way. And I think he's already got an in, he's got a, he's got an established, um, kind of group of single malt drinkers that, that all buy high end single malt from him, single cask stuff, um, really fancy whiskeys. And he's slowly, Rums to these same guys, and I think that's that's a good way to do it because it's the right crowd. It's not it's not a mass market stuff. He's already got in with the right the right crowd, the guys who are discerning whiskey drinkers. Um, so I, I think that's the right way to pitch it instead of trying to sell it at, at these sort of events where you've got uh, your average Joe who wants who wants clipped and coke. Um, <laughs> he doesn't want he doesn't want this rum. <laughs> Is that, is that the Whiskey Bros guy? No, no, it's actually not Whiskey Brothers. Whiskey Brothers has done a cast with us as well, but um, this guy is called, you can check him out online, he's, it's got a Spirit South Africa is his website, Spirit South Africa or Sierra Zede. Um and he's, as I say, he brought this whole hand and um, cask in, he, he, he went over and picked one of the casks and bottled it in 750s for South Africa. Um, which is really cool. I mean, I was shocked to see that one of the birds, I mean, I don't know how many bird releases there were, but only a couple. Um, and one of them in, in its entirety, entirety came to South Africa. So this whole cost came to SA, which is awesome. Um, and yeah, he, he, he's brought a whole lot of, uh, Habitation Valley Morba in from, from, uh, from Europe. He's I brought this long pond from him. I mean, he's, he's got, yeah, he's got some really nice runs. Um, and as I say, he's 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 in the right. He supplies Whiskey Brothers. So Whiskey Brothers is one of his customers. Um, yeah, I like very much what he's doing. You need to get a good friendship with this guy. Yeah, well, we do already. We we uh, message each other regularly. He's say he's taking a whole barrel from us. Um, uh yeah it's it's yeah and he's, he's, he's talking about a whole lot of other barrels as well so he's uh he's got big plans sounds like you're way in there because yeah i agree with you that that's you, you need a bit more sophisticated market to to get your brand going and yeah. get that recognition yeah. well yeah. I, I asked him to i sent him the link to this and asked him to uh to to dial in and or to 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 join in the meeting, but he said he had some other commitment at six o'clock, which was an hour ago or an hour before we started. So I don't know if he if he hasn't joined. He obviously hasn't had time to to join us. But uh, it's a pity. We'll um, do that. We'll do that next time. Cool. <laughs> Anybody? Any more questions? I'm I'm out of questions, and I feel like we're taking a lot of your time, Robert. I, know you're yeah, I just, guy. I just wanted, I just wanted to, 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 uh, to say to Carl that I'm, I'm really proud of doing, doing this thing with him, and, and he's got a rubber in Canada, and I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm rooting for him because, as I say, I, I appreciate what he's doing, and I, I kind of identify with it as well. I mean, he's, I also took quite a bold move to start making rum instead of mining, and uh, it's kind of what he's doing over there. I mean. A big leap to, to to take all your money and buy a rum with it and try and start a a brand up. That's that's really cool, and I, and I hope it, it goes well. And then also particularly him coming from from our neck of the woods, I really I really do hope it works and I hope it goes well. Thanks, Rob. I'm I'm sure it will. They're, they're, everybody's asking about yeah. it, so I'm, I'm sure it will go well. <laughs> We have to make it go well. Right? <laughs> it must go well. Yes. <laughs> now he's, he's got quite a few cheerleaders in Canada who want to see him do well. So I think he'll be okay. Okay. Good. Well, well he's got here in South Africa.
Robert, thank you. Uh, this was this was fantastic. I have so much information, and uh, we took a bit more time than I was expecting, and, and I'm you know I'm more than happy about that. Um, I know you're not used to doing this, so so thank you for taking the plunge and you know sitting there and and, and telling all your stories. It's been super super interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. An uh, honor to be on here with you. Thank you very much, and thank you to everybody else. Yeah, thanks, Carl and Richard and Eric and Meredith for your your input and, I, and 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 of course Eric and Carl doing this work for all our the rum geeks that can't get you know MOBA in our home markets. It, it's it's definitely making a major change for us who are dying for MOBA rum. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest thanks, of the day. Bye. Bye.